let's kind of start finding seats and we're going to get going because we probably have an overly ambitious schedule for tonight. <laughs> we may have bit off more than we can chew, we're going to find out. So welcome, first off. Thank you all for coming. Um, we really appreciate the uh, good turnout we always get for this event. It makes it very worthwhile for us. We want to make it worthwhile for you. This is kind of our big open house, our chance to show you guys everything that we've been up to. And tonight we're going to do things a little differently, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, as I mentioned, we have a pretty ambitious um, outline for what we want to do tonight. There's a bunch of different groups we're going to hear from. It's not just going to be DNR this evening. So. Uh, we'll try and keep things moving, keep it on pace. One thing I am going to ask is let's hold all the questions until the end, and then we can just have a, a free-for-all discussion at that point. But if we get onto you know little side tangents, it could take us quite a while to move through some of this material. So let's just jump right into it. This is the sixth year we have done this now, which is kind of crazy for me. Um, but it's kind of continued to grow and evolve, and this year our theme is going to be projects and partnerships. So I'm going to talk about some of the projects that the DNR has been working on. We're going to get updates from a lot of the groups that share our mission of making fishing better and making Hayward a fishing destination. And we're going to share information, the usual type of stuff about, you know, where we're doing surveys, what types of proposals are out there through the Conservation Congress, types of rule changes you might be seeing coming, and uh, other projects. We're going to start with what I'm calling the lightning round here, which is going to be really fast topics. One slide, just a few seconds to cover each one. First thing is something that we're very excited to announce. Our very own Scott Braden, who's in the back of the room there, just stepped up, has been with us, and many of you have gotten to know him over the last five years, as he's been a part-time employee. He was recently promoted to be a full-time fisheries technician with the Wisconsin DNR. He has now uh, assumed Russ Warwick's position. Russ retired back in April, so Scott is now the man here. We're very excited about that. If you know Scott, you know he's a super hardworking guy. He's absolutely crazy about fishing, and that's the type of person we want working for us. So can we give Scott a round of applause quick? <laughs> Great. And then we'll also be bringing back Evan, who was on with us last summer for the field season. Evan, crazy about doing fisheries work, loves fishing, so we have a really good team, which is important because we have a lot of work we want to get done, as you're going to see as we move along. Another new face that I'm excited to introduce is Angelina Sikora. She is from the area, more or less, from Mellon. She went to Northland College, and she is now the supervisor at the Governor Thompson Hatchery. Of course, we work very closely with Governor Thompson in this, in this uh, county. All of our walleyes, all of our muskies come from Governor Thompson, so Angelina is going to be a very important person for us. We're really excited about all the experience she's bringing to the job and um, a lot of fresh ideas and new perspectives. And Angelina is with us too, she's in the back of the room, so I think she'll be open to taking questions later if we have anything related to the hatchery and stocking. Another thing that I think is really neat that's happened lately is um, the Ladies Musky Fishing Clinic, and I'm not taking ownership for this, this isn't a DNR thing, this isn't Amanda Wilson and Deerfoot thing. Amanda put this clinic on last fall, and as you can see, it was very successful. A lot of women came out to learn about musky fishing, they had a lot of fun, um, they learned all sorts of different tips and techniques, and, and really became more fully integrated into the sport. And this is the type of thing that I fully support, I think this is fantastic. We always talk about attracting these new demographics to the sport of fishing, and Amanda's out there finding a way to actually do it. So big, big props to Amanda, and she's gonna be continuing that this year with two events. And on the way in, you should have got a fishing calendar from Scott, in addition to a survey. Fill out the survey, give it back to us, take that fishing calendar with you, and you can see a lot of the different events that are happening in the uh, area throughout the year, including both of Amanda's events. So if you're a woman and you wanna get more into musky fishing, or if you know somebody who might be interested, um, send them in that direction, and let's keep growing these types of events. I think this is great. Another thing that we did in the kind of um, outreach and education front to try and attract new anglers is our kids fishing that we've done at Shoes Pond for a long, long time, going back to when Frank was the biologist. But this year we partnered with the Hayward Lions Club and we put a new twist on the event. We've been seeing declining participation. This year we tagged some fish, we put them out there in the pond, and if kids caught those tagged fish, they qualified to win a scholarship through the Lions Club. I think every kid who caught a tagged fish ended up getting a scholarship, so very generous on their part. Really added a new element of excitement to this event. 
I will be honest, going into it, I had some reservations. I kind of feel like fishing should be the reward, but it's hard to argue with the results and how excited the kids were. And if they're outdoors and they're having a good time, it's a win. Let's just take the win, right? We did some work on the Couderay River this summer, which was really a lot of fun. Um, for those of you who don't know the area as well, the Grim Dam was on the lower end of the Couderay River. That dam was pulled out about 10 years ago. We were out there looking to see if sturgeon were recolonizing the Couderay, and we were really pleased with the results. We found sturgeon at many different locations throughout the Couderay, including 10 miles upstream from the confluence with the Chippewa. So they are taking advantage of that new habitat, moving into there, and providing a new fishery in the Couderay River. So that's something neat that you can check out in the future. And then I missed an anniversary last year, so I'm making up for it here. We missed the anniversary for 30 years of the River Rats program, which has kind of taken different shapes and names over time, but it's, it's 30 years of the program. Frank Pratt started in the mid 80s, doing watershed ecology and teaching kids about rivers. And we partner with the Cable Natural History Museum on this now, and it's uh, a great event because it does what we should be doing to teach kids about nature. We're letting them just jump right in and get muddy. And, they go nuts and we go nuts and it's a lot of fun. Another thing I want to mention is um, we completed a ramp extension project on the Chippewa Flow Edge at the Winter Dam. We extended the ramp 40 feet. That'll allow access under different water level conditions because of course we have different drawdowns and sometimes different water level issues out there. So this should allow access to the flow edge under pretty much any conditions. And there are plans to extend other ramps soon. We did the Winter Dam first because there were some other issues we wanted to address there with safety, but. Uh, CC North and CC South are kind of next on the docket. And this project was made possible by donations from the groups that you can see there. Um, we would not have probably been able to get this done this fall if they hadn't kind of come to the table and pushed it over the finish line. So a lot of props to them. And as we go through this presentation, I'm highlighting all these different groups we work with to show recognition for all of our partners and to kind of give you a feel for how connected this community is when it comes to doing fisheries projects. So you're going to see a lot more. Keep your eyes open. So from there, we're going to move into uh, a short discussion of what's coming up through the Conservation Congress. So the Conservation Congress hearings in 2018 will be in April. And these questions in this year are advisory only. And here's what that means. Nobody likes to think about politics, but it is a pretty good analogy here. The questions this year, it's kind of like a primary. This is winnowing down the field for what's going to appear in the final ballot that will end up being a rule change. So all of these are important, and these are topics that will be coming up this year. On the DNR side, we're asking a couple questions related to bass and bass fishing. One question is about whether we should create a catch and release bass season in March and April. Currently, the bass season closes after the first weekend of March and opens up again in May. People around the state would like to have more of a bass fishing opportunity, especially in the south where the water might be open and the weather might be pretty nice, and they want that opportunity to go out and fish more for bass in March and April. So that's a question we're going to ask. The other question is related to size and bag limit exemptions for catch and release bass tournaments. And there's two very important details within this question. We're talking specifically about bass tournaments. This would not apply to walleye, muskie, trout, anything else. And it's specifically catch and release. So if a tournament is going to get exempted, they have to have a permit that says, yes, we're going to release all these fish. It's going to be the same as um, just a day of fishing out in the water. They're all going to go back into the lake. Um, I think this one's interesting, and it definitely has some local importance, which is kind of the theme of what I pulled out here. There are more questions, but these are the ones with a lot of local importance. For that particular topic, you could use the Round Lake Tournament as an example. That tournament's been going on for quite a long time. They have continued to operate under special bass regulations that have really changed the way they do business. We have an 18-inch minimum length limit on smallmouth now, and they have to work around that. Creating an exemption would allow them to operate a tournament that's more similar to what they've done in the past. The fish still get released. Um, so that's of particular interest on any of these lakes, especially the ones where we might now have an 18-inch length limit on smallmouth, which is becoming a little more common. Other states do have this, as by way of background information. Uh, Florida, Kansas, Connecticut, which is a kind of a random collection of states, but those are ones that um, I know for sure have it because they've done some studies. And Minnesota recently started doing it on Mille Lacs. So this is out there and, and kind of has been tried out. So we're asking the question, is this something we want to do here in Wisconsin? On the Conservation Congress side, there's a variety of questions with both local and statewide importance, and I pulled a few out here to show you. Um, there's a question about reducing the panfish bag limit in the chip of flowage. That started here as a citizen resolution last year. There's a question about changing the largemouth minimum size to 12 inches, moving the trout opener a month, up a month into April, creating a lifetime hunting and fishing license, 
a question about whether the Congress should adopt more of a position on climate change, a couple questions that have big significance for some of the people in this room, if you're a guide, questions that would require guides to carry insurance and CPR training certifications, and a question about increasing the guide license fee. So these are all the questions that are on there this year. Again, these are advisory questions, but it's very important that we come and get feedback here because this determines what goes forward and what doesn't. So if you like one of the ideas here, you want to come support it, do that. If you like, if you see one of the ideas here that you don't like, this is your first chance to weigh in on it. If a question advances, it'll then appear again on the 2019 uh, Congress hearings, and that would be as a rule change. It would take effect probably in 2020, depending a bit on, on so how, how some of these rules lay out. So, Where can you do that? Conservation Congress 2018, 7 p.m., April 9th, Winter High School. 7 p.m., April 9th, Winter High School. It's also on your handy fishing calendar. So um, that is the time and place to come and weigh in on these questions. And we hope to see a lot of people there. It's really important that we get this type of involvement. Otherwise, we have really important decisions being made by a very small number of people, and that doesn't always go very well. If there's a change that you'd like to see that's not included here, you can always write a citizen resolution. And in fact, that Chippewa Flowage Panfish Regulation uh, question that the whole states can be voting on started as a citizen resolution right here in this room last year. So these things do go places. They can get legs and take off, and that can become a rule uh, in the future. I know we have at least one citizen group that's interested in doing a citizen resolution this coming year. Tiger Cat Flowage Association has, has something for um, their bass regulations. So you will probably see some local questions. Frank, as our most senior Conservation Congress delegate present tonight, would you give us a short update on what's going on in Congress world? Sawyer County delegate, I don't know who, who outranks you between you and Larry. There are some very interesting things going on in the Conservation Congress right now, and not surprisingly, the Senate right here in Haywood, and as usual, we are doing the field truthing and development of those programs. I have with me here tonight, Chance Lee, and Logan Christensen, who are the Sawyer County Youth Delegates for the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. And this is a new program that we're sort of, that's sort of evolving. Uh, you might have noticed on the way in, Logan was tying the 10,000th fly, lure, et cetera, that we've made in the Angler Ed program since the year 2000. We were stuck at 19 or 9,999. <laughs> Logan tied a lead-free leech for John Myrie, so we're up to 10,000. I would like to get more people with me into that angler mentor program. Maybe we could take and multiply that 10,000 by 10,000 by 10,000. Uh, another program that's going on in the Wisconsin Conservation Congress is right here, right now. Last year we had a resolution for developing fish advisory committees by county, very similar to the deer committees that we have, where we have an expanded local level role other than just the spring hearing, where we did things like public education, training, uh, got feedback from the group on where you thought the local manager should be going with regulations and other management. Well, we're doing it right here. The Executive Council of the Conservation Congress has pretty much empowered me to run with it here. And whatever we develop here, and we're moving into, what's this, Max, fifth, sixth year we've done this? Sixth year. We're moving toward a program that's going to be emulated by the rest of the state. I see Dave Newswanger in the audience. It was his, this was sort of his idea. Larry Bondi's idea, who's head of the Wisconsin Conservation Congress, and Ron Brook before he retired from the DNR. And Max sort of took it in and of itself and has run with it. And I just love the direction it's going in. I see the Youth Conservation Congress involved in education and outreach. I see the Congress doing more local level advisement and having a little bit more say in local management with the local manager. And I just see, what well, we saw at the spring hearing last year, more involvement in the Conservation Congress than just plain the hook and bullet people. The other people, the quiet sports people, the bird watchers, what we call the bunny huggers, I guess, but the other people that are involved with and have a stake in the natural resources. 
are now starting to get interested. And I think through groups like this, we're going to be able to take the non-consumptive user and the hook and bullet people and fuse them together. And once we do, we have a powerful force. Because we are going to need a powerful force. I don't know if any of you saw on the way in that great big fish that was sitting on the walk. That's a flathead catfish. Logan picked that up below the spillway at the Haywood Dam last night. That's 200 miles upstream from where it's supposed to be. And when I first started working for the DNR in 1974, George Becker, when he wrote Fishes of Wisconsin, commented that flathead catfish were really rare in Wisconsin, and you had to get down the Mississippi into Iowa, down around Dubuque, before you really ran into them in any great numbers. And now they're here on our doorstep. Largemouth bass are charging north. The catfish are not far behind them. It's all an index of one thing, climate change. We need to get serious about that.